Welcome to 9 to 5, the blueprint on how to invest your time, energy, and passion to create a life of purpose broken from the chains of paycheck servitude. I'm glad you're here. Let's get started. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of 9 to 5. I am your host, Jack, and in this episode, I wanted to cover one of the tricks that I've implemented since the early times of my marriage as well as early times of my professional career that has significantly advanced and leapfrogged my progress towards my own financial independence. And I want to share the seven benefits that I have identified at least seven. There's been many, many benefits of implementing this strategy, but I'll share with you the top seven and give you some tips in how you can implement it and some of the benefits that you'll be getting from this strategy. It's going to be a very simple strategy, but don't confuse that with an easy strategy. Anything related to saving money requires discipline, it requires consistency, and it requires a set of rules to help you achieve that goal because as humans, our human condition does not always want us to save the money and delay gratification. You know, we have money as a tool to get things that give us pleasure or give us satisfaction in some way, shape or form or security. And we get that through the spending of that money and turning it into an activity, an experience, a product, a service, whatever it is. And to delay that ability, um, it goes against human nature. And a lot of successful investing goes against human nature. But what I want to do is show you how to kind of overcome that and the secret to doing that is by focusing on the benefits that this strategy gives you. So let's go ahead and dive into it. First, we're going to set the stage that this is going to take the form, this talk is going to take the form of a specific scenario, a kind of a set of assumptions so we're all on the same page. But if you don't follow under the stereotype, that's okay. You can take the benefits from it and find ways of implementing it in your own life. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go. So the first assumption is that you're going to have some sort of financial stability, not independence. You're still totally dependent on your paycheck, but you're at least able to make ends meet through your job or through whatever it is you're using to generate income. And the second assumption, and this is where we're going to have some uh, flexibility here, is that you have found that special someone in your life or somebody that uh, you share financial burdens with, whether it be a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend. But if you are single, uh, there are many ways of being able to take this uh, and simply consolidate it down into a single paycheck or a single source of income stream and implement the same advice. All right, so what is this fancy secret that supercharges your financial independence journey? And it is a very simple strategy that I'll go ahead and tell you to you now. It's create a lifestyle where you can live entirely off of a single paycheck of your uh, two paychecks assumption here and save 100% of the other paycheck. So if there's two people bringing in two incomes, live off of one and save 100% of the other. Very simple, right? And it was so simple that when I first heard of this strategy, I kind of, I, I disregarded it. I thought that, okay, what's the big deal? And it came about before I got married, but my now wife's sister, she sat down with us and she was so happy for us. And she's one of those that will give you advice over things, whether you ask for it or not. And she really imparted some wisdom on us uh, on this one occasion where she said that, it was a burden for her and her family when she decided to become a stay-at-home mom because they had grown into the lifestyle of their double incomes, her and her husband's income. And so when she made that leap, they felt immediate pain and suffering from the decrease in lifestyle. And so what she recommended us going into our marriage was to not spend everything we make and, and to be able to slow down and kind of I'll talk about the benefits in a, in a moment, but to be able to have simply a, a more modest lifestyle that uses only one paycheck. So that's it. It's, it's simple. There's beauty and simplicity, but there are incredible benefits that you can experience from it. And I briefly alluded to some of those uh, in that story. So let's go ahead and walk through the seven benefits that I have found by implementing this rule in my own family. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. The first benefit that I have found is that it sets the tone for your relationship. It sets the tone for your relationship with money, with how you 
have trust in your relationship and how you have respect for your spouse or your significant other. So often I find couples that go the total opposite end of the spectrum where it's not a matter of looking at our consolidated money and working towards a goal, but they take the opposite end. It's this is my money and that is your money. And I will do what I want with my money. You do what you want with your money. You know, a total separation of church and state uh, where you know, maybe they will separate the bills and say, okay, out of the guy's paycheck, we're going to pay for the phone bill. And out of the girl's paycheck, we're going to pay the rent or whatever the case may be. But the, essentially, there's this cloak, this shield between the accounts of each individual in the relationship. And I can understand, given the culture we have, that there is a, a um, you know, there's a incentive to do that. And I did some research as I was preparing for this episode, and it's amazing the type of advice you hear online. And it goes along with this culture of the prenuptial agreements, the culture of having an escape plan when you get into a relationship, all these things that just breed mistrust and breed the the idea that a relationship is just, it's good while it's good, and when it's no longer good, I'm going to leave. And this is not going to be an episode about marriage advice, far from it, but it's simply about this idea of what independence and what dependence means. You know, we as people, we have an emotional need to join up and to become one. You know, I'm not going to get biblical on you, but the Bible continuously talks about how you know, the husband will leave his, or the man will leave his family and cling to his wife and they will become one and, and all of that good stuff. And this idea that we're going to reject the trust and keep the separation between the, each other, it just does not set a good tone for a relationship. It basically says that I'm not going to be fully committed. I'm always going to be able to walk out. And I get it. You know, if you're in a relationship where there are secrets or uh, you didn't have the full information going into it, uh, that's a tough situation. And this strategy, in order to be successful, in my opinion, it really requires you to combine your finances, your goals, and your future. You as a family become a single united front and you work with each other towards that common goal of financial independence for the greater good that it offers. And there's a number of benefits of simply not being dependent on paycheck to paycheck and not having to have that separation between the two um, w within it. And you know, I can go into uh, a little statistic here where 27% of Americans say that they argue about finances more than their kids, their chores, their work, their friends, and really everything else. That their financial arguments are the most prevalent in their life. And it kind of makes you wonder how much of that is due to the fact that they might not be totally open about their finances. And so when there are surprises or when the guy goes off and spends his guy money on something and it's against what the, the girl wants, I'm just using stupid examples here. But if you're open and honest, it's more of a strategic discussion about where you're moving forward with your finances. It's no longer an argument about something that happened after the fact. So luckily, my family, my wife and myself, we have very similar philosophies on finances. When we got married, we immediately launched into this strategy. And even prior to meeting each other, we've always been uh, relatively disciplined savers and just haven't been the most spendy people that we know. And what this has caused us, uh, what, what this has enabled us is freedom of choice, where when we decided to sit down and start a family, my wife's income went down to zero and because we had this open honest um view on finances it didn't really hit us too hard you know we knew what was going on we knew my income we knew her income we knew where our expenses were and how we were covering them and it's enabled her to pursue that vocation in life you know fast forward two years later because my wife is such a go-getter while she was staying at home she discovered online business through blogging and already she's you know killing it and um out earning myself even with my full-time you know 50 60 hour a week corporate job so the point being uh, getting yourself in the right mindset and the right relationship is critical uh for the strategy 
The second benefit is that it supercharges your emergency fund. And we're going to do a little bit of math in this section here. So I'll try to explain it for those of you that are listening on your commute. So Americans in general are pretty terrible at having an emergency fund. An emergency fund is just a either a low interest uh, CD or, or an easily, I'm sorry, not a CD, a low interest savings account or something that you can quickly get at uh, that covers a, a time frame of expenses. So maybe a six month uh, living expense is a pretty standard um, uh, run of the mill emergency fund. And I pulled up uh, some statistics from Bankrate and looking at millennials and baby boomers, the two separate generations, the numbers are not that positive on either of them. So looking at the emergency savings by generation, only 23% of millennials have t- six months or more saved up in their emergency fund. Baby boomers have 38% saved up, which you would assume baby boomers being you know that further on in life in their earning career, they would have a better emergency fund savings saved up. But it gets kind of worse as we go through. 27% of millennials uh, say they only have three to five months of their living expenses saved up. 11% for baby boomers. And then kind of the worst one, looking at those that have none saved up, no emergency fund to speak of, millennials show 25% have zero saved up in their emergency fund, while baby boomers show 27% saved up in their emergency fund. And that statistic right there, that one really floored me when I found this was it's not just the younger generation that is in a bad place financially, which is a scary truth, but that kind of fuels what I'm trying to do here and preach practices that have been successful for me and that it can be easily implemented for you. All right. So how does this strategy supercharge your emergency fund? I put together a calculator and it's free of charge. You can just go to 9to5.com forward slash one. That's just the number one, 9to5.com forward slash one. And scroll down and you'll find a, a sign up box where you can sign up for my free emergency fund calculator. And what this does is it helps you find out how long it'll help you to jumpstart your financial independence journey by building up that first emergency fund. And I've done a couple scenarios here uh, that you can see if you go to that same uh, 9to5.com slash one, where I walk through uh, two scenarios, one where each of you is making $1,000 a month and through your own uh, living a little bit more frugally, you only require $750 per month to survive. Now, when I say survive, it doesn't mean going to Starbucks every day and getting your $6 lattes, and it doesn't mean going to the movie theater, you know, dropping 50, 60 bucks for bonbons to watch the latest superhero movie. We're talking about rent, insurance, gas, and basic expenses here. And part of this mean, part of the strategy is that until you get to that place of stability, you should be cutting back a little bit on your discretionary spending uh, to help fuel that emergency fund and provide that stability. So with both of you earning $1,000 per month and only really needing $750 per month to survive, these are simple numbers, obviously. Um, And let's say you wanted to target to have an emergency fund of six months of living expenses. Uh, It's only going to take you in this scenario between four and five months to build up that emergency fund. And the math there is pretty simple. I go into another scenario, which is a little more tricky, where if you don't earn evenly, let's say that the paycheck, the first paycheck, the man or the woman, you you pick in your own little fantasy, earns two thousand dollars in the month, where the second paycheck earns twelve hundred dollars per month, so almost half or a bit over half of the first paycheck, and your required expenses for the couple is twenty one hundred dollars, so they require more money to live than any single paycheck combined. So if that couple also wanted to create a six months emergency fund, they're going to need to save up $12,600 given their $2,100 per month uh, expense needs. And I apologize for all the numbers. If you're listening, again, go to 9to5.com forward slash one, and you'll be able to see all of this on the, on the blog post. But with that target, even with a relatively uh, high cost of living relative to their earnings, they're able to achieve that emergency fund within the first year, within one year of saving, just saving the second paycheck, only saving the uh, $1,200 paycheck. 
And truthfully, because their required spending is greater than the first paycheck, they're actually not able to save that full paycheck. They can only save 1100 of the $1,200 paycheck. But if they create the lifestyle that supports that expenses, they're going to have a fully stashed emergency fund within the first year. And as we get further on in the benefits, you'll see the huge benefits of having that fully stashed emergency fund. So let's move on. So to me, the third benefit of having that emergency fund is that it teaches you financial independence superpowers is what I'm calling it. And the entire world of financial independence kind of took me by storm. Like I said, I've always been a relatively decent saver, but the idea of being able to live off of your passive income or live off of a business that you've built and leave the corporate job and the stability was just uh, amazing to me. I've never really been entrepreneurial growing up and I didn't come from a long line of entrepreneurs. But the idea of FI, as I short shorthand it, uh, it's very it's not commonly talked about in America. You know, the idea of retirement is at 65 years old, you pray that you have a pension built up or a 401k built up and that it might last for a few years until you can start to rely on the younger generation if you've uh, had kids and that they'll be able to help float you or that the government will help you out with Medicare, or Medicaid, all those things, entitlement programs to help you survive. And it's just not the way that I want to live. I don't want to force dependence upon somebody else. I don't want to become a dependent that I've had 18 years of being a dependent and I'm proud to say that I don't need that anymore. And so by learning the even just the simple power of creating a lifestyle within your means and living off of a single paycheck even if you earn too, it has it pays huge dividends in uh in peace of mind and in other ways that we'll talk about in just a second. So teaching that superpower, it becomes a gateway drug that then starts to dive into how can you invest that money more effectively. And once you've created that emergency fund, what do you do with the next paycheck that you get to save? You know, what do you do with, do you start a business? Do you do other things? And all of those are topics I'm looking forward to talking about. So the fourth benefit is it goes a little bit along with the first benefit, but it's reduced stress in your relationship. And we mentioned that 27% that say uh, that finances are their number one argued point. So this is another one. If you don't have a emergency fund to speak of, if you're one of those, I think it's around 25% of both millennials and baby boomers that have $0 saved up and you're living paycheck to paycheck, a single issue, a single black swan event, like a flat tire or a broken window or your car doesn't start one day, that can be a huge source of stress. You know, where, are you going to go to one of those payday loans and take out a 15% loan or something like that? And it becomes a slippery slope because once you've gotten used to borrowing money to get through to the next paycheck, you're you're just going to become comfortable with carrying debt, carrying a balance on your credit card or owing people money or becoming, uh, you know, it, it just, it creates this bad way to live life. And I hate to be uh, not so eloquent as I say that, but it, it creates a downward spiral, I guess is what I mean to say. And why would you want to do that? There, there's so much to stress out about as there is in life. You know, you've got a job, you've got kids, you've got schedules to deal with, you've got chores to do, you've got activities to follow around and be involved in your community. Uh, if you're like me, you might have a side hustle or some passion project that you want to be able to contribute to. And w you just can't be everywhere at once. And if your mind is focused on your financial situation in a negative way, if, if you're just trying to figure out how to make it to the next end, to the next paycheck, I just don't think you're going to be able to separate and be a part of all those other things as well. So what I can say is that the only arguments, and I'll loosely call them arguments, that I have in my relationship about money is on more the strategic thing, on what to do with our money you know, and, and what do we want to invest in. Um, for example, I'm a very high risk uh, investor. I, I trade options in my spare time. I enjoy having a high risk tolerance because I'm a long-term thinker. Uh, my wife, however, you know, bless her heart, you know, she's terrified of the stock market and of the idea of risking money to make money. And 
so those are the types of arguments that we get to have. But we never argue about a $200 repair we need to have on our car or tuition for our children or anything of that nature. So emergency funds and the lifestyle that supports that uh, reduces stress in that relationship. The fifth one is that new opportunities now become available. For example, you know, have you had dreams of being a stay-at-home mom or supporting uh, your girlfriend or spouse to be a stay-at-home mom? Have you ever wanted to you know, take a risk and try an entrepreneurial venture? Or have you ever just wanted to take a sabbatical and take an unpaid leave from your job or quit your job to you know, circumnavigate the globe or uh, you know, go to Europe and backpack for a few months? These are all common things, especially if you're kind of uh, up and coming and younger and you have that adventurous spirit within you. But oftentimes that simply becomes an infeasible thing to do uh, due to our American general habits around money. But if you got into that habit of religiously sitting down and doing your budget and understanding what you can afford and what you can't and building in that emergency fund, you know, you don't have to stop at six months. If you wanted to, you can build up, you know, a year, two years of savings, uh, whether they're actively invested or just sitting in a bank account. But once you have that built up, depending on what your goals are, the whole world becomes an opportunity. You know, you can say no to your boss and and you know not take that transfer, and go try something new, take a risk, try, start a business online, do whatever it is that you want to do. But if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you become a slave to that paycheck, and that's something that I just I never want to go back to. And I want to be able to produce this content to help you avoid it as well. So the sixth benefit is that your recreation will become more creative. And this is kind of a silver lining benefit because when you start out on this journey, likely you have fallen prey to lifestyle inflation. You know, it's it's basically the concept of the turtle in the fishbowl or the turtle bowl or turtle cage, turtle, whatever. Basically, if you get a baby turtle and you put it into a small little fishbowl, it's gonna stay a baby turtle. But as soon as you buy that turtle a larger fishbowl, He's going to start to grow and fill up that new space. And my sister has a, I think he's a 14 year old turtle at this point. And this thing's a monster because every time she would see him grow, she'd get so proud of him and say, oh, he needs more space. And so she'd buy him a larger fishbowl. And now this thing is, it looks like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. It's a little bit creepy. But the, the point being, financially, getting back on topic here, is that the more money you earn, oftentimes the more money we find to spend. And we do that through more expensive recreations, more expensive cars, more expensive housing situations, all of that. And in my opinion, relying on spending money to create those fun, memorable experiences, I find that as a sign of weakness. And I don't mean weakness in a bad way, but it's simply you're not flexing those creative muscles to find unique ways to do with what you have or create memorable lasting experiences without needing to go and pay for somebody else to invent that experience. You know, be your own Disney world at home. I don't want to show you what my house looks like, but it looks like a full blown preschool. I think in the background right now, you can see a little play tent, uh, which was a hand me down, but it is pretty awesome. And the ability to simply go out and make your own adventures, um, I think it pays off extremely well, not only in the money that it saves you, but also in your own memory bank. You know, you will create experiences that nobody else will have. Everybody's had the same Disney World experience. Everyone's sat in the lines and ridden on the teacups and all that good stuff. And they're fun, but they're a cookie cutter experience. And I think that by forcing yourself to flex those creative muscles will save you money to help you achieve your lifestyle goals and your savings goals. And it may also create a more lasting and memorable experience in your own family. And the seventh and final benefit that I included in this post is that it enables you, it enables you to take more risks at work. And this is one that I've really been flexing recently and I've seen some incredible results from these risks. And I start with a quote here from John JFK. There are risks and costs to action, but there are far less than the long range risks of comfortable inaction. So you have great potential. And I'll just start out here for all you that are listening. You wouldn't be searching for ways of saving money and ways to make better uh, financial decisions if you didn't already have those thoughts stirring in your head and if you didn't really have those uh, ambitions in your own mind. 
And when I go to work and I work for a great company, I love my company. I, I, they've done amazing things for me and I appreciate all of that. But a frustration I continually see is the lack of passion in those around me. You know, people that have become, you know, cogs in the wheel. You know, they've, they've either been beaten down through uh, rejection or through missing a promotion or whatever the case may be, but they've simply resigned to taking orders and implement, implementing their orders. Some of it is imposed upon from, like I said, being beaten down, but there's also another piece of it that I think comes from desperation. There are some people in this world that if they're living paycheck to paycheck, all they want to do, and I'm sure you've heard this uh, phrase in your own job, just don't rock the boat. Just do what you're told. Say yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Go home at five and pick it up and go again tomorrow. You know, this, this idea of not really trying to make the world a better place or not trying to put your brain into your job. Um, it's, it's not the way that I want to live. And I can empathize with those that are in the position where they don't feel allowed to speak their own voice because what if their voice is not received well? And what if they, you know, get in trouble for trying to implement their own ideas at their job? If you're living paycheck to paycheck, you can't take that risk. I guess that point's arguable. I'm not going to say that you can't take that risk, but I can understand those that are afraid to do so. But once you have built up that safety net, and once you have realized that you can start to make money on your own, or you can start to invest that money, you can start to, uh, you know, create those opportunities that having a savings nest gives you, you're allowed to start taking some risks at work. You start to become a little more emboldened and, when that when you start to become bold what i've found is that the absolute opposite of your fears comes true and what i mean by that is you know if you volunteer on a stretch project because you know you can take that risk it's something that you're passionate about and you're not afraid of making a mistake your boss is going to overlook if that project is not a wild success he'll understand that it was something that you took on as a stretch but if you succeed, you will be recognized for it. So it's one of those where it's an asymmetrical reward system. You know, there's much more reward than there is risk. The big risk or the big cost is the time and the passion it's going to take for you to accomplish it and to work through it. And another thing that I've used recently that has worked counterintuitively is being able to say no when they push your boundaries. You know, we all have boundaries in life. You know, I have kids. I, when I first started out in my career, I did not have kids. I was married, but I worked into the night. I worked before work started. I worked during work. I didn't talk to my spouse and I was a workaholic. But as my kids were born and as I realized they were growing up, all of a sudden my priorities made a shift that I'm very grateful for. And when I was home, I was home with my kids and I if I got called a couple of times in a row, I would check in to see if something was burning, but I stopped checking the email. I stopped working on the workbook. I stopped doing the things that I would be doing years before. And what I found is that you become a better worker when you compress those times. And there's a ton of studies about why the eight hour work day is how it is. It's because we get really dumb and we get really inefficient as we work into that 10th, 12th, 13th hour of the day. So the third one is to be able to negotiate a raise. And what I've noticed is the I've had conversations with folks about negotiating raises, you know, some of my college uh, friends and all of that. And what I found is the people that have the worst management of money are the ones that are the most afraid to ask for more money. And I find that kind of paradoxical, I guess. Part of it is because they understand they're living paycheck to paycheck. They they stick to that rock the boat philosophy and they don't want to do anything to risk that paycheck. And the other side of it could be is that they probably realize about themselves that if they get more money, they're just going to find other ways to spend that ad additional money. So once you have your safety net uh, saved up, though, you start carrying yourself with a little bit of a different air, I found, you know, you're a little bit more confident 
And also in the fact that if you go and ask for more money and you if you've done some of the things we talked about before, like volunteering and succeeding on stretch projects and being able to show your values um, by kind of being your, your own thinker, by being able to say no when decisions are not the right decisions potentially, your company is going to value that. If you're a performer and if you have that confidence, you'll probably be surprised at how willing they are to make sure they keep you happy because that keeps you working correctly and well. All right, so those were the seven benefits. I'm just gonna run through real briefly the, uh, just the titles because that was, a, that was a, a lot we covered there. So the first benefit is that it sets the tone for your relationship with your money, your trust, and your respect with your significant other. The second one is that it supercharges your emergency fund. We covered some examples there. The third one is that it teaches you financial independence superpowers early on in your professional and relationship life. The fourth one is it reduces stress in your relationship. The fifth is that it creates new opportunities. And the sixth is that your recreation will become more creative and memorable. And the seventh is it enables you to take more risks at work. All right, so we covered a lot here and I hope you're interested, uh, but Saving money, like I said, it's simple, but it's not easy. So I have some tips for you in how you could get started if you're interested in taking this journey and becoming uh, more financially independent. And the first thing I recommend you do is sign up for personal capital because the first step is you need to understand where your money is coming from and you need to set that savings goal of what you want to achieve. And what I found is that without being able to see the inflows and outflows of the money and kind of what you're doing, it becomes very difficult to do. So if you would like to sign up for personal capital, you can go to 9to5.com slash personal capital, all one word, 9to5.com slash personal capital. There will also be a link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. But the first step is just to understand uh, you know, where your income is, you know, what's, uh, who's it coming from, if you want to kind of separate in your mind that you want to maybe say, uh, spend her money and save his or vice versa. It's just good to have that visualization. The second step is you want to determine the flip side where your expenses are coming from. And personal capital makes this extremely easy. You can click on the banking tab and see your expenses and your income. And you're going to f see some that stick out more than others, uh, things that are necessary and things that are not necessary. But you need to understand first where they all are. And you can keep this at a category level. You'll, you'll notice uh, in personal capital, if it doesn't know how to categorize something, it'll just say uncategorized. Uh, and in another episode, I can talk about how to go ahead and categorize those a little bit more intelligently. But by a basic rule of thumb, you want to understand what the categories are, your restaurants, your utilities, what you're spending online, uh, things of that nature. So now you've you know what your goal is and you know where your expenses are. So you need to have a way to decide what you're going to start cutting out of your life. And you could do this two ways. And I have a definite, definite preference. You can rip the bandaid off and just cut out all spending. That's not absolutely necessary. And I do not recommend that because I fear you're going to go into shock by doing that. And saving money is something that is, you know, it's continuous improvement. The goal is about making progress over time and eventually you'll achieve your goals. So what I would recommend you do instead is to start visualizing your expenses with what I call the value versus cost method. And what that means is I want you, if you're listening to this and not seeing uh, my screen right now, is visualize a two by two matrix. So you've got your Y axis and your X axis. And on one, let's say on the right to left X axis, that's your value. So on the right, you've got high value. On the left, you've got low value. And then on the up and down, the Y axis, you've got cost. And so at the top, you've got high cost and the bottom, you've got low cost. So value and cost, aren't those the same things? Well, no, let me explain. To me, value is the utility, the benefit, the enjoyment, you know, the positive stuff you get from what you're spending your money on. For example, you know, your home provides a lot of utility, a bed, a kitchen, you know, maybe a shower if you're lucky. So there's a lot of value in having your home. But a movie night, Maybe there's some value in that experience, but you could get the same value by watching Netflix for you know eight bucks a month or whatever the case might be. So there would be less value in that movie night than there is to your, yours rent check. 
And then on the cost side, that's the amount of resources that something requires. You know, it could be money, obviously, but it could also be your time, your energy, your, uh, you know, a number of different things that you could say is a resource that you're spending. So paying your rent is extremely high of an expense, um, but your movie night might not be that big of a deal. So you would have a high cost, high value with your rent or your mortgage, and you would have a low value, low cost for the movie night. So what you do in this little two by two matrix is just start jotting out all of the things you're seeing on personal capital where they belong on that two by two spectrum. So, you know, the highest value, highest cost items in the top right quadrant, the low value, low cost in the bottom left, and just start scattering things along there. So you can start to, you know, prioritize what expenses you're going to want to start getting rid of and in what order. It would make no sense for you to give up your rent First, when you have something that is maybe a high cost but low value, uh, you know, like uh, I don't have an example right now, but that movie night, it would make sense for you to give up your home before you'd give up your movie night. So you have to have a system to go about uh, getting through your expenses systematically. And if you'd like a copy of this value versus cost worksheet, you can go right back to that same website, 9to5.com forward slash one, 9to5.com forward slash one, scroll down there, and you can see I have a PDF that you can download for free. Um, so you can go through and uh, make this kind of an activity with your uh, significant other. So the third step is you're gonna to wanna to set your monthly goals to eliminate the lowest ranking expenses first. So you're gonna to wanna to get rid of those high cost, low value ones first and work your way up through the spectrum on that downloadable uh, PDF. There's instructions on kind of which quadrants you should target first, but set your goals on one or two of those categories and make measured progress against those. And finally, step four is to keep track of how you're doing and celebrate the small wins. Saving money is hard. It's simple, but it's hard. So make sure that you uh, re reward yourselves, um, not by spending money, but reward yourselves in, in keeping track of it. And you can do really well. You can compare the current month to the prior month and personal capital is really, really easy. All right, so that was a really, a lot of content to cover for such a simple strategy. So I hope you got one or two things to take away from this little discussion and I, all I can tell you is that by starting this simple strategy, it's changed my life dramatically. You know, it's enabled my wife to stay at home for us to not worry about money as we're having enough to worry about with three kids now. And it's also um, launched an entire business that we had no idea was even possible when we were living um, you know, without this financial security. So go ahead and log in to Personal Capital. Go to 9to5.com forward slash one download those tools and get started yourself. Leave a comment below on if you have a similar strategy or a different strategy in how you save up for your emergency funds and just what has that done for your family by having that stability. If you have any questions, you can always email me at jack at 9to5.com. And until next time, happy saving.